Thank you very much. It's uh, my pleasure to be here back with all friends at uh, Scale by the Bay. Um, if you have never seen one of my talks before, I tend to put in uh, pictures in the backgrounds of uh, hiking trips. Um, this was a mistake. Uh, it was, you know, it's actually a blurred image, but I love the way it came out, so I kept it. Uh, these pictures are from uh, the, the Gila uh, Wilderness Area in New Mexico. Uh, so yeah, I, I work at Domino Data Lab. I previously worked at AnyScale, which was the company that was spun out of Berkeley to um, develop Ray, and that's how I got interested in it. I think you'll find it a really interesting toolkit for doing distributed computing. Uh, what I particularly like about it is from the end user point of view, it's extremely easy to use, whereas maybe it doesn't give you quite the you know, bells and whistles and flexibility of a toolkit that you may know like Akka or something like that. But uh, you know it has a nice compromise for you know let's say the ninety percent case. So anyway, uh, briefly, Domino Data is um, uh, it provides a uh, enterprise platform for data science. It's it's designed to integrate a lot of the open source tools you know and love like Spark, Spark T-shirt, um, uh, you know, Ray, Python, R, MATLAB, you know deep learning frameworks and so forth to give you an environment to help you manage all your resources, your experiments, your deployments and all that stuff. So anyway, uh, if you're interested in more, check out dominodatalab.com. We are hiring Scala developers. If you're out there looking, we'd love to hear from you. And also I know that AnyScale is probably hiring for people with experience with Ray or interested in Ray for Python. And they also do have a Java interface now besides Python, if I forget to mention that later. Okay, so anyway, let, let's uh, make the case for Ray. You know, why was it created? Uh, what is it designed to do? And you'll also see the API. It's actually a very concise, small API, but it does a, a lot of things for you. And then I'll talk about the, uh, at least one of the machine learning libraries that's built on top of Ray, how it leverages Ray under the hood while mostly hiding Ray uh, behind you know, a domain specific abstraction. But I'll also talk about Ray for microservices. It's a very general framework, and I think it has some interesting uh, implications for how we build, whether we call them microservices or services. I think you'll find that an interesting bit. And then I'll finish with just a bit about how you could uh, learn more about Ray. Okay, so first, you know, why Ray? What, what problem is it solving? Uh, you know, why do we have it? Well, it kind of uh, emerged out of a couple of uh, problems that we faced in the industry. This chart on the left is a log chart of basically the compute required to train neural networks going back, you know, about eight years or so. And in fact, the, um, the AlphaGo Zero is actually uh, a toy compared to some of the natural language processing uh, uh, neural networks out there that are on the order of 200 billion parameters and require millions of dollars of compute resources to train. So it's just been this huge uh, exponential growth, you know, basically 35 times each year, while Moore's law has only been growing by about you know, 2x per year, uh, two years or so. So we have to go distributed. That's the only way we're gonna uh, solve this problem. Even GPUs are not gonna just uh, get us out of this uh, conundrum. The other big trend is that data science has in large measure migrated to Python. You know, There are other languages, I just mentioned a few of them in fact, but a lot of the stuff being done today is done in Python. And so, you know, bringing these two together, people really need compelling, powerful tools for distributing, not just on a single machine, like multi-threading, but going over a whole cluster. And um, there aren't too many ways to do it that are uh, easy to use. And I think uh, Ray is actually the easiest to use I've ever seen, and yet it gives you really good performance as well. Okay. So it really was, this is the key thing. It was created by the people who needed it, you know, these researchers at Berkeley. And uh, what they wanted is something that did a lot of this heavy duty lifting of, you know, for distributed systems, but they didn't want to have to think about it too much because they were trying to do research in artificial intelligence and so forth. So they just wanted something that worked that we kind of stayed out of the way most of the time. And I think you'll be kind of amazed at how well it does this. Uh, but just a few more details to, uh, to set the stage. Um, this is kind of one way you could think about the this, this sort of processes you have to do in a typical environment that's going from you know, modeling your problem to deployment. I won't go into all the details here, but all of this stuff typically requires distributed computing to scale. There's a lot of tools that are available for various facets of this problem. Uh, and it's kind of an engineering challenge to glue all this together. Well, one of the goals with Ray is maybe if we build the right distributed framework under the hood, then all of the other 
tools that we need that are specific to these different problems can be written on top of Ray with relatively you know, little uh, effort and you have kind of a unified framework underneath. Uh, and so that's kind of the promise of Ray. Um, there's actually um, some more libraries now that, you know, like third party libraries are starting to use Ray, like uh, Hugging Face, Horvod, uh, Spacey. Those are three examples of using Ray in different ways under the hood to get distributed scaling. All right, so let's actually see how it works. Um, and you'll be kind of amazed at how little of an API there actually is, but how concise and powerful it is. So, one of the things they did right, I think, is start with concepts we already know from Python and really any language. So that hopefully, uh, you'll make this will make sense whether you're using Scala, Python, Java, whatever. But how can we extend those concepts to give us distributed computing uh, without a lot of mental overload? So I've got a couple of Python functions on the left, one of which is going to return a NumPy array. NumPy is a popular library for manipulating arrays of data in the Python ecosystem. You know, don't really care how it's done. I just want a method that returns an array. And then I'm going to have another method that adds two of them together. And you'll see why I'm doing this in a second. Very familiar kind of Python code. If I want to turn this into a distributed task, which is the Ray terminology, then I just have to add this uh, decorator at ray.remote, and now I'll be able to run these things as distributed tasks. And what that actually looks like, well, I guess I should say, if you, for completeness, you're going to have to do a few imports, and you're going to have to initialize Ray. Now, if you're just on a laptop or you know, a server, it will you know, spin up Ray locally and let you use all of the cores in your environment. That's actually a non-trivial thing for Python. But if you're actually uh, passing the right arguments to this uh, method, it can connect to a big cluster. And the largest I've heard of, or uh, there's a company in China that's running like 10,000 nodes of Ray to do various things. All right, so uh, the other difference is that you don't call this method the way you normally do. You, you call it with this dot remote invocation. And the main reason for doing this really, you know, Python's a dynamic language, it'd be easy enough to intercept the call to make Ray and have it do this magic. But having this dot remote is great documentation. You can read this code and very quickly see what's invoking Ray versus what is, is just regular synchronous Python code. This thing is going to start this remote task somewhere in a cluster. Here I'm saying it's going to run on node one somewhere, and it's going to immediately return a reference. Uh, this will be our handle, you know, like a future where I'll be able to get the value that's computed at some point in the future. I'm going to do this again. This time, maybe it schedules on another cluster node. And then finally, I'll take the two arrays that I get back, and I'll uh, add them together with this add array invoked in the same way as before. Um, so if you look at this code, just kind of glance at it, it doesn't look that much different than what you would write if it was just a single threaded uh, you know, program using NumPy. But there's just a little hooks that we've added here that give us a, this distributed computing. There's a couple of other things that are going on automatically for us that make it a whole lot easier to use. Uh, finally, I should say, how am I going to get stuff out of this reference? I call ray.get, and that will block until this ref3 is available. But here's the important thing. First of all, um, I can just go ahead and call this add arrays, and Ray will internally schedule it when it actually has the data that it needs available from the first two tasks that were invoked. So it, it you know, handles that sequencing for me. I don't have to put in logic to wait for these things to be ready, uh, and then just you know, call, them, uh, call them, uh, add arrays when it's ready. Now, the other thing it did for me is add arrays takes two uh, NumPy arrays, but I actually passed it two references. So Ray will automatically unpack those and extract the values and do that for me. So it's just you know, minor tweaks to how I would have written this in a uh, synchronous, um, you know, single threaded way. I've got something that can now run at scale over a cluster. And it does all of this sort of magic behind the scenes that I have to do with typical you know, distributed computing. So that's pretty nice. And that's what attracted me to Ray beginning in the beginning. Now, one thing I haven't solved at all with this example is like managing distributed state in any way. Um, and here again, they took something we already know how to do, which is classes, which is the you know the typical way in an object-oriented language that we encapsulate bits of state, uh, you know, manage updates and accesses and so forth. So I've got this very simple class that is uh, got a counter. Every time I call increment, it's going to increment this value internally. Something that's very easy to understand if you know, you know pretty much any object-oriented language. And to make this an actor, and they actually use that term, which you may know from uh, Akka and some other frameworks, Erlang, for example, 
Uh, all I have to do is add the sanitation again at ray.remote or decorator, I think is the correct term. And now it's going to be distributed over a cluster and the state is going to be managed wherever this thing is running. Now, there is one other thing I have to do. Unlike Python, I can't just reach in and read the field values of an actor. I have to have an accessor method to do the read or write. So I've added this get count method if I want to retrieve the count later. It's also returned by the increment method, as you may have noticed. Uh, and then we call it the same way. We construct actors uh, with dot remote. We call methods with dot remote. And we can also call ray.get with an array of references. So it will wait till they're both finished and then return. For, you know, the first one is going to have the value one. The second one will have the value two because that's, you know, I called the first one, it incremented to one, return that state. The second one's going to have this return the state of two. So that is really it. I mean, that is like 80, 90% of the Ray API. There's other methods for doing a little bit of configuration. Uh, you can manage those references a little bit more carefully if you want and so forth, but it really isn't much more than that. So it's a very concise API that has a lot of power behind the scenes, which is great. All right, let me talk a little bit about machine learning libraries that are based on Ray and leverage Ray. Um, and I had this chart earlier that showed you several of them. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about is my personal favorite, which is the reinforcement library called RLlib. It's probably the biggest and uh, most widely used of the Ray libraries that come with Ray. And you can get to documentation about this if you go to rllib.io. I kind of uh, glossed over it earlier, but uh, ray.io is the uh, website to find out more about Ray. All right, if you've never heard of reinforcement learning before, you don't know what it is, concisely, this is what it's all about. There's some environment, some world that an agent is trying to negotiate in some way. The agent is going to observe the state of the world and make a decision about what action to take next, then observe the new state of the world and whatever reward was received by that action. And the goal is for the agent to maximize the cumulative reward. You know, we call these things episodes where we go through these steps and by the end of the episode, we want to maximize the reward. Now, how's the agent going to know how to do that? Well, you, what you end up doing is running these sequence, these uh, simulations or whatever over and over and over again. And you train a policy uh, under the hood that uh, tries to get really smart about making the right actions given the, the circumstances. And one of the ways that you can train those policies is with a neural network, but that's not actually required for this. This is actually not a new idea. There's variations of reinforcement learning that have been around for a while, but it really got popular a few years ago, uh, primarily because it was used to beat the world's best Go players. It was used to achieve expert gameplay in a number of games like Atari games. Um, and it just really uh, proved uh, the benefit of this powerful technique for a certain kind of sequential problems. Whether you're playing a game or you know, walking through a, an obstacle course. These are sequential processes and you have to learn how to navigate them. So quickly, some of the other applications of reinforcement learning, it's being used for things like robotics and autonomous vehicles, training them how to operate, training like this robot a hand to uh, place books. It's starting to be used to optimize and simulate uh, industrial processes. This I think is one of the interesting cases where it's breaking out of uh, these examples that are maybe kind of limited for most of our interests, like robotics and games are a lot of fun, but, you know, day to day, the kind of stuff all of us are doing in enterprises, maybe not quite as relevant, but when you start modeling the, the, the uh, workflows in the enterprise, the assembly lines, and I picked a state of the art picture of an assembly line here, this is the kind of stuff that's also being used there. It's been used for system optimization, like optimizing power usage and HVAC systems you know, network routing, hopefully a little better than this uh, picture of a crappy uh, wiring uh, job that somebody did. One of the interesting recent examples has been actually using it for ad serving and recommendations. Recommendations is a problem we've known how to solve for a while. We've had, there's these things called collaborative filters and so forth. Many of you may have actually used recommendation engines in your day jobs. Well, now it's starting to be applied to uh, uh, or reinforcement learning is starting to be applied to this problem. And there's two reasons for that. One is that for very, very large environments, like think about Netflix and its user base and its catalog, uh, the, the uh, computation required for some of the classic methods is pretty intensive. 
Um, and also, it doesn't really account well for the evolution of your preferences as uh, you know you change and, and as the catalog change and so forth. This is a system that's actually proving very interesting for modeling these problems and uh, recommendation uh, reinforcement learning that is, and and doing a better job at these these tasks. And of course, finance, you know, they use whatever the latest hot thing is to try to optimize trading on something that is also time oriented, which is you know, the stock market and so forth. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit more about Go as a uh, reinforcement learning problem. Just to put a little bit more detail on what these terms are in the upper right. So in this case, the observations are the board state, you know, where the stones are on the board. The actions are where to place the next stones. And interestingly enough, there's no immediate rewards as you play. The, the way they modeled it is you either win or you don't. So there's only a reward at the very end of whether you win or, or lose. But they used a neural network to model this and found when they analyzed it that it tend, you know, various layers um, uh, looked at various uh, levels of granularity of the state of the board. Okay, back to reinforcement learning with Ray with RLLib. It's designed to be not only very performant by using Ray at the bottom, but also to give you lots of abstractions for building new algorithms. This is an area of hot research. There's a lot of different algorithms. They're structured in very different ways. And they also interact with uh, simulators and environments in different ways. That's what the top four boxes are. I won't really go into those now for time's sake, but it's designed to be really flexible for building these kinds of systems. Uh, this is a, an eye chart that lists some of the algorithms. These are like state-of-the-art research algorithms that are available in Ray. Um, won't really talk, uh, talk about them in more detail for, for now, but actually all of these links, and I'll make the slides available, we'll, you know, we'll take you the information about them. And you can also use this stuff in SageMaker, and it's also available in Azure if you want to play with these things, and you're already using those environments. Okay, back to uh, the motivation for Ray a little bit. You know, I, I mentioned that these researchers were running into problems. Uh, they want they needed to scale to clusters. They you know had just huge compute requirements to train new reinforcement learning algorithms and other uh, problems in in machine learning. Um, and so, what are some of the, the forces that drove the evolution of Ray? Well, one is that you know, you, you're going to have to run these simulators or game engines or whatever fairly efficiently and at scale and over and over and over again. So you need something that's pretty flexible and not just kind of pigeonholed, if I can put it that way, into one kind of compute, like, you know, uh, a SQL query kind of compute problem or a stream problem, or, you know, I'm going to read a lot of records of the same format and do mapping and filtering and, you know, uh, transformations. Uh, very different kind of uh, memory access and CPU access patterns in simulators. And the agent that we're training, you know, whatever we're using for the policy could also be something that isn't a neural network. But in this case, we actually need to do all the neural network stuff efficiently. Actually, the way uh, Ray, RLib, and other uh, Ray-based libraries tend to work is they make it a lot easier to, to work with PyTorch, TensorFlow, and so forth, rather than try to write those libraries themselves. So in a lot of ways, it's an integration a system as well as you know writing custom algorithms. All of this has to be done over and over again as efficiently as possible to leverage your resources, you know, with very heterogeneous compute. And that all of this kind of drove the kind of um, design and intent of Ray, but also to make it very generic for not only these kind of problems, but others that we'll look at in just a second. And then finally, it is very performant. These are some benchmarks of you know, hand rolled implementations of some of these reinforcement learning algorithms versus the ones that were implemented in Ray, which has to be a lot more flexible and, and the performance has been very comparable for them. All right, let's talk about microservices. For those of you that aren't actually doing reinforcement learning, how is this going to be useful for you? Well, there's a lot of, um, and there was a great panel earlier today about microservices. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you build them. All I'm really going to focus on is the last bullet point, um, that sometimes you need to manage things separately. You, 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 you know, the typical DevOps thing is I have a team that owns microservice one. Not only do they implement it, but they run it. And same for, you know, team two and, and so forth. Well, there's an interesting problem we have, which is that, um, we always end up running multiple instances of these microservices, both because no one machine has enough resources to, to meet the capacity we may have, and we're already running other stuff on that machine, so we have to go distribute for that reason. 
And also we need them for resiliency and failover and so forth. So that if, you know, if I'm running one instance of a microservice on one machine and it crashes, you know, that could be a lot worse than if I have uh, failover capabilities. But it means that we, and this has been one of the challenges with microservices is that we've got all this stuff to keep track of now in production, even though we might only have three microservices in this trivial example or three different applications, let's say. I've got, you know, a lot more instances than that to, to take care of. Well, one of the cool ideas about Ray, and whether it's Ray or something like it, and I don't want to oversell this as like a magic bullet, but I think this is a really compelling idea that because Ray is, is handling in a very reusable generic way the dis distribution of work over a cluster, what we could actually do is go back to a model where we really just implement one application instance, but behind the scenes, Ray is scaling the work over a cluster to give us the resiliency and the scalability we need. So that we're not so much explicitly managing instances anymore. We're back to a more logical view of how we've got three things going on. And those three things are uh, in some sense, transparently scaling for us over the available resources. So I think it's a really compelling idea that we can do this. It, it, it dovetails nicely with Kubernetes because Ray is very fine grained. Recall those tasks and actors I had at the beginning, you know, very small things. They, they nicely fit into, into pods, virtual machines or physical machines, however you want to do it. All right, finally, some, uh, just some notes if you want to, if you're interested in learning about uh, Ray and trying it out. Um, if you're already using some multi-processing, multi-threading libraries like joblib or multiprocessing.pool in Python, there's some drop-in replacements uh, written in Ray where you just change the import statement and now you're actually scaling up to a cluster. So it's a pretty nice way to get some immediate benefit while still uh, using the libraries that you already know how to use. And if you know what async IO is, it also uh, integrates nicely with the Ray. That's another way that you can actually drive the Ray APIs with async IO. Once again, go to Ray.io to find out um, you know, everything there is to know about Ray, uh, blog posts and all kinds of stuff. I actually wrote most of the tutorials at anyscale.com slash academy. And these are actually uh, freely available on GitHub. So you can try it out and actually learn about RLlib if you want. Um, and then there's the Ray Slack. This link actually goes to a Google forum to sign up for the Ray Slack. That's the best place to get uh, uh, help in the, from the community. And there's, but there is also a Google group. I don't have it on here, but uh, check out AnyScale as well. They're actually starting to, or beginning to offer um, Ray as a service if you're interested in just having them worry about how to run it. So to conclude, um, Ray is really a very interesting take on the uh, need for a, a easy to use, but powerful and capable distributed computing environment that uh, really minimizes the amount of work you have to do in Python and also in Java now. Uh, to you know, scale stuff to a cluster. And so I encourage you to check it out. And if you're interested in you know, deep learning or you know, reinforcement learning, check out some of these other libraries as well. Okay, that's it for me. Um, uh, here's, you can reach out to me at uh, this address or uh, spam me on Twitter and uh, please check out Domino Data as well. And uh, I'll, uh, the slides are actually already at my polyglotprogramming.com website if you're interested. It's a longer version of them, but you'll find them there. And I'm happy to take any questions for the next five minutes and then we'll flip over to the um, uh, spatial chat. Mm -hmm.